The Manchester Marriage by Elizabeth Gaskell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Household Words, a weekly journal conducted by Charles Dickens. Christmas number, 1858. Mr. and Mrs. Openshaw came from Manchester to London and took the house to let. He had been what is called in Lancashire a salesman for a large manufacturing firm who were extending their business and opening a warehouse in London where Mr. Openshaw was now to superintend the business. He rather enjoyed the change of residence, having a kind of curiosity about London which he had never yet been able to gratify in his brief visits to the metropolis. At the same time, he had an odd, shrewd contempt for the inhabitants, whom he had always pictured to himself as fine, lazy people, caring nothing but for fashion and aristocracy, and lounging away their days in Bond Streets and such places, ruining good English, and ready in their turn to despise him as a provincial. The hours that the men of business kept in the city scandalised him too, accustomed as he was to the early dinners of Manchester folk and the consequently far longer evenings. Still, he was pleased to go to London, though he would not for the world have confessed it, even to himself, and always spoke of the step to his friends as one demanded of him by the interests of his employers, and sweetened to him by a considerable increase of salary. His salary indeed was so liberal that he might have been justified in taking a much larger house than this one, had he not thought himself bound to set an example to Londoners of how little a Manchester man of business cared for show. Inside, however, he furnished the house with an unusual degree of comfort, and, in the winter time, he insisted on keeping up as large fires as the grates would allow in every room where the temperature was in the least chilly. Moreover, his northern sense of hospitality was such that, if he were at home, he could hardly suffer a visitor to leave the house without forcing meat and drink upon him. Every servant in the house was well warmed, well fed and kindly treated, for their master scorned all petty saving in aught that conduced to comfort, while he amused himself by following out all his accustomed habits and individual ways in defiance of what any of his new neighbours might think. His wife was a pretty, gentle woman, of suitable age and character. He was forty-two, she thirty-five. He was loud and decided, she soft and yielding. They had two children, or rather, I should say, she had two, for the elder, a girl of eleven, was Mrs. Openshaw's child by Frank Wilson, her first husband. The younger was a little boy, Edwin, who could just prattle, and to whom his father delighted to speak in the broadest and most unintelligible Lancashire dialect, in order to keep up what he called the true Saxon accent. Mrs. Openshaw's Christian name was Alice, and her first husband had been her own cousin. She was the orphan niece of a sea captain in Liverpool, a quiet, grave little creature, of great personal attraction when she was fifteen or sixteen, with regular features and a blooming complexion. But she was very shy, and believed herself to be very stupid and awkward, and was frequently scolded by her aunt, her own uncle's second wife. So, when her cousin Frank Wilson came home from a long absence at sea, and first, was kind and protective to her, secondly, attentive, and thirdly, Desperately in love with her, she hardly knew how to be grateful enough to him. It is true, she would have preferred his remaining in the first or second stages of behaviour, for his violent love puzzled and frightened her. Her uncle neither helped nor hindered the love affair, though it was going on under his own eyes. Frank's stepmother had such a variable temper that there was no knowing whether what she liked one day she would like the next or not. At length, she went to such extremes of crossness that Alice was only too glad to shut her eyes and rush blindly at the chance of escape from domestic tyranny offered her by a marriage with her cousin, and liking him better than anyone in the world except her uncle, 
who was at this time at sea. She went off one morning and was married to him, her only bridesmaid being the housemaid at her aunt's. The consequence was that Frank and his wife went into lodgings, and Mrs. Wilson refused to see them, and turned away Nora, the warm-hearted housemaid, whom they accordingly took into their service. When Captain Wilson returned from his voyage, he was very cordial with the young couple, and spent many an evening at their lodgings, smoking his pipe and sipping his grog. But he told them that for quietness's sake, he could not ask them to his own house, for his wife was very bitter against them. They were not very unhappy about this. The seed of future unhappiness lay rather in Frank's vehement, passionate disposition, which led him to resent his wife's shyness and want of demonstration as failures in conjugal duty. He was already tormenting himself, and her too, in a slighter degree, by apprehensions and imaginations of what might befall her during his approaching absence at sea. At last he went to his father and urged him to insist upon Alice's being once more received under his roof, the more especially as there was now a prospect of her confinement while her husband was away on his voyage. Captain Wilson was, as he himself expressed it, breaking up and unwilling to undergo the excitement of a scene, yet he felt that what his son said was true. So he went to his wife, and before Frank went to sea, he had the comfort of seeing his wife installed in her old little garret in his father's house. To have placed her in the one best spare room was a step beyond Mrs. Wilson's powers of submission or generosity. The worst part about it, however, was that the faithful Nora had to be dismissed. Her place as housemaid had been filled up, and even had it not, she had forfeited Mrs. Wilson's good opinion for ever. She comforted her young master and mistress by pleasant prophecies of the time when they would have a household of their own, of which, in whatever service she might be in the meantime, she should be sure to form part. Almost the last action that Frank Wilson did before setting sail was going with Alice to see Nora once more at her mother's house, and then he went away. Alice's father-in-law grew more and more feeble as winter advanced. She was of great use to her stepmother in nursing and amusing him, and although there was anxiety enough in the household, there was perhaps more of peace than there had been for years, for Mrs. Wilson had not a bad heart, and was softened by the visible approach of death to one whom she loved and touched by the lonely condition of the young creature, expecting her first confinement in her husband's absence. To this relenting mood, Nora owed the permission to come and nurse Alice when her baby was born, and to remain to attend on Captain Wilson. Before one letter had been received from Frank, who had sailed for the East Indies and China, his father died. Alice was always glad to remember that he had held her baby in his arms and kissed and blessed it before his death. After that, and the consequent examination into the state of his affairs, it was found that he had left far less property than people had been led by his style of living to imagine, and what money there was was all settled upon his wife and at her disposal after her death. This did not signify much to Alice, as Frank was now first mate of his ship, and in another voyage or two would be captain. Meanwhile, he had left her some hundreds, all his savings, in the bank. It became time for Alice to hear from her husband. One letter from the Cape she had already received. The next was to announce his arrival in India. As week after week passed over, and no intelligence of the ship's arrival reached the office of the owners, and the captain's wife was in the same state of ignorant suspense as Alice herself, her fears grew most oppressive. At length the day came, when, in reply to her inquiry at the shipping office, they told her that the owners had given up hope of ever hearing more of the Betsy Jane, and had sent in their claim upon the underwriters. Now that he was gone for ever, she first felt a yearning, longing love for the kind cousin, the dear friend, 
the sympathising protector whom she should never see again, first felt a passionate desire to show him his child, whom she had hitherto rather craved to have all to herself, her own sole possession. Her grief was, however, noiseless and quiet, rather to the scandal of Mrs. Wilson, who bewailed her stepson as if he and she had always lived together in perfect harmony, and who evidently thought it her duty to burst into fresh tears at every strange face she saw, dwelling on his poor young widow's desolate state, and the helplessness of the fatherless child, with an unction as if she liked to the excitement of the sorrowful story. So passed away the first days of Alice's widowhood, by and by things subsided into their natural and tranquil course, but, as if this young creature was always to be in some heavy trouble, her ewe lamb began to be ailing, pining and sickly. The child's mysterious illness turned out to be some affection of the spine, likely to affect health, but not to shorten life, at least so the doctors said. But the long dreary suffering of one whom a mother loves as Alice loved her only child, is hard to look forward to. Only Nora guessed what Alice suffered, no one but God knew. And so it fell out, that when Mrs. Wilson, the elder, came to her one day in violent distress, occasioned by a very material diminution in the value of the property that her husband had left her, a diminution which made her income barely enough to support herself, much less Alice, the latter, could hardly understand how anything that did not touch health or life could cause such grief, and she received the intelligence with irritating composure. But when, that afternoon, the little sick child was brought in, and the grandmother, who after all loved it well, began a fresh moan over her losses to its unconscious ears, saying how she had planned to consult this or that doctor, and to give it this or that comfort in luxury in after years, but that now all chance of this had passed away. Alice's heart was touched, and she drew near to Mrs. Wilson with unwanted caresses, and, in a spirit not unlike to that of Ruth, entreated that, come what would, they might remain together. After much discussion in succeeding days, it was arranged that Mrs. Wilson should take a house in Manchester, furnishing it partly with what furniture she had, and providing the rest with Alice's remaining two hundred pounds. Mrs. Wilson was herself a Manchester woman, and naturally longed to return to her native town. Some connections of her own at that time required lodgings, for which they were willing to pay pretty handsomely. Alice undertook the active superintendence and superior work of the household. Nora, willing, faithful Nora, offered to cook, scour, do anything in short, so that she might but remain with them. The plan succeeded. For some years their first lodgers remained with them, and all went smoothly, with the one sad exception of the little girl's increasing deformity. How that mother loved that child is not for words to tell. Then came a break of misfortune, their lodgers left, and no one succeeded to them. After some months they had to remove to a smaller house, and Alice's tender conscience was torn by the idea that she ought not to be a burden to her mother-in-law, but ought to go out and seek her own maintenance, and leave her child. The thought came like the sweeping boom of a funeral bell over her heart. By and by, Mr. Openshaw came to lodge with them. He had started in life as the errand boy and sweeper out of a warehouse, had struggled up through all the grades of employment in the place, fighting his way through the hard, striving Manchester life with strong, pushing energy of character. Every spare moment of time had been sternly given up to self-teaching. He was a capital accountant, a good French and German scholar, a keen, far-seeing tradesman, understanding markets and the bearing of events, both near and distant, on trade, and yet with such vivid attention to present details that I do not think he ever saw a group of flowers in the fields 
without thinking whether their colours would or would not form harmonious contrasts in the coming spring muslins and prints. He went to debating societies and threw himself with all his heart and soul into politics, esteeming, it must be owned, every man a fool or a knave who differed from him and overthrowing his opponents rather by the loud strength of his language than the calm strength of his logic. There was something of the Yankee in all this. Indeed, his theory ran parallel to the famous Yankee motto, England flogs creation, and Manchester flogs England. Such a man, as may be fancied, had had no time for falling in love or any such nonsense. At the age when most young men go through their courting and matrimony, he had not the means of keeping a wife, and was far too practical to think of having one, and now that he was in easy circumstances, a rising man, he considered women almost as encumbrances to the world, with whom a man had better have as little to do as possible. His first impression of Alice was indistinct, and he did not care enough about her to make it distinct. A pretty, yea, nay kind of woman, would have been his description of her if he had been pushed into a corner. He was rather afraid, in the beginning, that her quiet ways arose from a listlessness and laziness of character, which would have been exceedingly discordant to his active, energetic nature. But, when he found out the punctuality with which his wishes were attended to, and her work was done, when he was called in the morning at the very stroke of the clock, his shaving water scalding hot, his fire bright, his coffee made exactly as his peculiar fancy dictated, for he was a man who had his theory about everything, based upon what he knew of science, and often perfectly original, then he began to think, not that Alice had any peculiar merit, but that he had got into remarkably good lodgings. His restlessness wore away, and he began to consider himself as almost settled for life in them. Mr. Openshaw had been too busy all his life to be introspective. He did not know that he had any tenderness in his nature, and if he had become conscious of its abstract existence, he would have considered it as a manifestation of disease in some part of his nature. But he was decoyed into pity unawares, and pity led on to tenderness. That little helpless child, always carried about by one of the three busy women of the house, or else patiently threading coloured beads in the chair, from which by no effort of its own could it ever move. The great grave blue eyes, full of serious, not uncheerful expression, giving to the small delicate face a look beyond its years. The soft plaintive voice dropping out but few words, so unlike the continual prattle of a child, caught Mr. Openshaw's attention in spite of himself. One day, he half scorned himself for doing so, he cut short his dinner hour to go in search of some toy which should take the place of those eternal beads. I forget what he bought, but, when he gave the present, which he took care to do in a short abrupt manner, and when no one was by to see him, he was almost thrilled by the flash of delight that came over that child's face, and could not help, all through that afternoon, going over and over again the picture left on his memory by the bright effect of unexpected joy on the little girl's face. When he returned home, he found his slippers placed by his sitting-room fire, and even more careful attention paid to his fancies than was habitual in those model lodgings. When Alice had taken the last of his tea-things away, she had been silent as usual till then. She stood for an instant with the door in her hand. Mr. Openshaw looked as if he were deep in his book, though in fact he did not see a line, but was heartily wishing the woman would be gone and not make any palaver of gratitude. But she only said, "'I am very much obliged to you, sir. Thank you very much,' and was gone, even before he could send her away with her. "'There, my good woman, that's enough.' For some time longer he took no apparent notice of the child. He even hardened his heart into disregarding her sudden flush of colour and little timid smile of recognition when he saw her by chance. But, after all, this could not last for ever, 
and having a second time given way to tenderness, there was no relapse. The insidious enemy having thus entered his heart in the guise of compassion to the child, soon assumed the more dangerous form of interest in the mother. He was aware of this change of feeling, despised himself for it, struggled with it, nay, internally yielded to it, and cherished it, long before he suffered the slightest expression of it, by word, action, or look, to escape him. He watched Alice's docile obedient ways to her stepmother, the love which she had inspired in the rough Nora, roughened by the wear and tear of sorrow and years. But above all, he saw the wild, deep, passionate affection existing between her and her child. They spoke little to anyone else, or when anyone else was by, but, when alone together, they talked and murmured and cooed and chattered so continually that Mr. Openshaw first wondered what they could find to say to each other, and next became irritated because they were always so grave and silent with him. All this time he was perpetually devising small new pleasures for the child. His thoughts ran, in a pertinacious way, upon the desolate life before her, and often he came back from his day's work, loaded with the very thing Alice had been longing for, but had not been able to procure. One time it was a little chair for drawing the little sufferer along the streets, and many an evening, that ensuing summer, Mr. Openshaw drew her along himself, regardless of the remarks of his acquaintances. One morning in autumn, he put down his newspaper as Alice came in with the breakfast, and said, in as indifferent a voice as he could assume, Mrs. Frank, is there any reason why we two should not put up our horses together? Alice stood still in perplexed wonder. What did he mean? He had resumed the reading of his newspaper as if he did not expect any answer, so she found silence her safest course, and went on quietly arranging his breakfast without another word passing between them. Just as he was leaving the house to go to the warehouse as usual, he turned back and put his head into the bright, neat, tidy kitchen where all the women breakfasted in the morning. "'You'll think of what I said, Mrs. Frank,' this was her name with the lodgers, "'and let me have your opinion upon it to-night.' Alice was thankful that her mother and Nora were too busy talking together to attend much to this speech. She determined not to think about it at all through the day, and, of course, the effort not to think made her think all the more. At night she sent up Nora with his tea, but Mr. Openshaw almost knocked Nora down as she was going out at the door, by pushing past her and calling out, Mrs. Frank, in an impatient voice at the top of the stairs. Alice went up, rather than seem to have affixed too much meaning to his words. "'Well, Mrs. Frank,' he said, "'what answer? Don't make it too long, for I have lots of office work to get through tonight.' "'I hardly know what you meant, sir,' said truthful Alice. "'Well, I should have thought you might have guessed. You're not new at this sort of work, and I am. However, I'll make it plain this time. Will you have me to be thy wedded husband?' and serve me, and love me, and honour me, and all that sort of thing, because if you will, I will do as much by you, and be a father to your child, and that's more than is put in the prayer book. Now, I'm a man of me word, and what I say I feel, and what I promise I'll do. Now, for your answer. Alice was silent. He began to make the tea, as if her reply was a matter of perfect indifference to him. But, as soon as that was done, he became impatient. Well, said he, how long, sir, may I have to think over it? Three minutes, looking at his watch. You've had two already. That makes five. Be a sensible woman. Say yes, and sit down to tea with me, and we'll talk it over together. For after tea I shall be busy. Say no, he hesitated a moment, to try and keep his voice in the same tone, and I shan't say another word about it but pay up a year's rent for me rooms to-morrow, and be off. Time's up. Yes or no? If you please, sir, you have been so good to little Elsie. There, sit down comfortably by me, on the sofa, 
and let us have our tea together. I'm glad to find you're as good and sensible as I took you for. And this was Alice Wilson's second wooing. Mr. Openshaw's will was too strong, and his circumstances too good for him not to carry all before him. He settled Mrs. Wilson in a comfortable house of her own, and made her quite independent of lodgers. The little that Alice said with regard to future plans was in Nora's behalf. No, said Mr. Openshaw, Nora shall take care of the old lady as long as she lives, and after that she shall either come and live with us, or if she likes it better, she shall have a provision for life, for your sake, missus. No one who has been good to you or the child shall go unrewarded, but even the little one will be better for some fresh stuff about her. Get her a bright, sensible girl as a nurse, one who won't go rubbing her with calf's foot jelly as Nora does, wasting good stuff outside that ought to go in, but will follow doctor's directions, which, as you must pretty clearly see by this time, Nora won't, because they give the poor little wench pain. Now, I'm not above being nesh for other folks myself. I can stand a good blow and never change colour, but set me in the operating room in the infirmary and I turn as sick as a girl. Yet, if need were, I would hold the little wench on me knees while she screeched with pain if it were to do a poor back good. Nay, nay, wench, keep your white looks for the time when it comes. I don't say it ever will, but this I know. Nora will spare the child and cheat the doctor if she can. Now, I say... Give the bairn a year or two's chance, and then, when the pack of doctors have done their best, and maybe the old lady has gone, we'll have Nora back. I do better for her. The pack of doctors could do no good to little Elsie. She was beyond their power. But her father, for so he insisted on being called, and also on Alice's no longer retaining the appellation of Mamma, but becoming henceforward Mother, by his healthy cheerfulness of manner, his clear decision of purpose, his odd turns and quirks of humour, added to his real strong love for the helpless little girl, infused a new element of brightness and confidence into her life, and, though her back remained the same, her general health was strengthened, and Alice, never going beyond a smile herself, had the pleasure of seeing her child taught to laugh. As for Alice's own life, it was happier than it had ever been. Mr. Openshaw required no demonstration, no expressions of affection from her. Indeed, these would rather have disgusted him. Alice could love deeply, but could not talk about it. The perpetual requirement of loving words, looks and caresses, and misconstruing their absence into absence of love, had been the great trial of her former married life. Now, all went on clear and straight, under the guidance of her husband's strong sense, warm heart and powerful will. Year by year their worldly prosperity increased. At Mrs. Wilson's death, Nora came back to them as nurse to the newly born little Edwin, into which post she was not installed without a pretty strong oration on the part of the proud and happy father who declared that if he ever found out that Nora ever tried to screen the boy by a falsehood, or to make him nesh either in body or mind, she should go that very day. Nora and Mr. Openshaw were not on the most thoroughly cordial terms, neither of them recognising or appreciating the other's best qualities. This was the previous history of the Lancashire family, who had now removed to London and had come to occupy the house. They had been there about a year, when Mr. Openshaw suddenly informed his wife that he had determined to heal long-standing feuds, and had asked his uncle and Aunt Chadwick to come and pay them a visit and see London. Mrs. Openshaw had never seen this uncle and aunt of her husband's. Years before she had married him, there had been a quarrel. All she knew was, that Mr. Chadwick was a small manufacturer in a country town in South Lancashire. She was extremely pleased that the breach was to be healed, and began making preparations to render their visits pleasant. They arrived at last. 
Going to see London was such an event to them that Mrs Chadwick had made all new linen, fresh for the occasion, from nightcaps downwards. And as for gowns, ribbons and collars, she might have been going into the wilds of Canada, where never a shop is, so large was her stock. A fortnight before the day of her departure for London, she had formally called to take leave of all her acquaintance, saying she should need all the intermediate time for packing up. It was like a second wedding in her imagination, and, to complete the resemblance which an entirely new wardrobe made between the two events, her husband brought her back from Manchester, on the last market day before they set off, a gorgeous pearl and amethyst brooch, saying, "'Lunnon should see that Lancashire folks knew a handsome thing when they saw it.' For some time after Mr and Mrs Chadwick arrived at the open shores, there was no opportunity for wearing this brooch. But at length, they obtained an order to see Buckingham Palace, and the spirit of loyalty demanded that Mrs Chadwick should wear her best clothes in visiting the abode of her sovereign. On her return, she hastily changed her dress, for Mr Openshaw had planned that they should go to Richmond, drink tea, and return by moonlight. Accordingly, about five o'clock, Mr and Mrs Openshaw and Mr and Mrs Chadwick set off. The housemaid and cook sat below, Nora hardly knew where. She was always engrossed in the nursery in tending her two children and in sitting by the restless, excitable Elsie till she fell asleep. By and by the housemaid Bessie tapped gently at the door. Nora went to her and they spoke in whispers. Nurse, there's someone downstairs wants you. Wants me? Who is it? A gentleman. A gentleman? Nonsense. Well, a man then, and he asked for you, and he rung at the front door bell, and has walked into the dining room. You should never have let him, exclaimed Nora. Master and Missus out. I did not want him to come in, but when he heard you lived here, he walked past me, and sat down on the first chair, and said, Tell her to come and speak to me. There is no gas lighted in the room, and supper is all set out. He'll be off with the spoons, exclaimed Nora, putting the housemaid's fear into words, and preparing to leave the room, first, however, giving a look to Elsie, sleeping soundly and calmly. Downstairs she went, uneasy fears stirring in her bosom. Before she entered the dining room, she provided herself with a candle. With it in her hand, she went in, looking round her in the darkness for her visitor. He was standing up, holding by the table. Nora and he looked at each other, gradual recognition coming into their eyes. Nora, at length he asked. Who are you? asked Nora, with the sharp tones of alarm and incredulity. I don't know you, trying by futile words of disbelief to do away with the terrible fact before her. Am I so changed? he said pathetically. I dare say I am, but Nora, tell me, he breathed hard. Where is my wife? Is she, is she alive? He came nearer to Nora and would have taken her hand, but she backed away from him, looking at him all the time with staring eyes, as if he were some horrible object. Yet he was a handsome, bronzed, good-looking fellow, with beard and moustache, giving him a foreign-looking aspect. But his eyes, there was no mistaking those eager, beautiful eyes, the very same that Nora had watched not half an hour ago, till sleep stole softly over them. Tell me, Nora, I can bear it. I have feared it so often. Is she dead? Nora still kept silence. She is dead. He hung on Nora's words and looks, as if for confirmation or contradiction. What shall I do? groaned Nora. Oh, sir, why did you come? How did you find me out? Where have you been? We thought you dead. We did indeed. She poured out words and questions to gain time, as if time would help her. Nora, answer me this question straight, by a yes or no. Is my wife dead? No, she is not, said Nora, slowly and heavily. Oh, what a relief. Did she receive my letters? But perhaps you don't know. Why did you leave her? Where is she? 
"'Oh, Nora, tell me all quickly.' "'Mr. Frank,' said Nora at last, almost driven to bay by her terror, lest her mistress should return at any moment and find him there, unable to consider what was best to be done or said, rushing at something decisive, because she could not endure her present state. "'Mr. Frank, we never heard a line from you, and the ship-owners said you had gone down, you and everyone else. We thought you were dead, if ever man was, and poor Miss Alice and a little sick, helpless child. Oh, sir, you must guess it, cried the poor creature at last, bursting out into a passionate fit of crying, for indeed I cannot tell it, but it was no one's fault. Good help us all this night. Nora had sat down. She trembled too much to stand. He took her hands in his. He squeezed them hard, as if by physical pressure the truth could be wrung out. Nora, this time his tone was calm, stagnant as despair. She is married again. Nora shook her head sadly. The grasp slowly relaxed. The man had fainted. There was brandy in the room. Nora forced some drops into Mr. Frank's mouth, chafed his hands, and, when mere animal life returned, before the mind poured in its flood of memories and thoughts, she lifted him up and rested his head against her knees. Then she put a few crumbs of bread, taken from the supper-table, soaked in brandy, into his mouth. Suddenly he sprang to his feet. "'Where is she? Tell me this instant!' He looked so wild, so mad, so desperate, that Nora felt herself to be in bodily danger. But her time of dread had gone by. She had been afraid to tell him the truth, and then she had been a coward. Now her wits were sharpened by the sense of his desperate state. He must leave the house. She would pity him afterwards, but now she must rather command and upbraid, for he must leave the house before her mistress came home. That one necessity stood clear before her. She is not here. That's enough for you to know. Nor can I say exactly where she is, which was true to the letter, if not to the spirit. Go away and tell me where to find you tomorrow, and I will tell you all. My master and mistress may come back at any minute, and then what would become of me with a strange man in the house? Such an argument was too petty to touch his excited mind. I don't care for your master and mistress. If your master is a man, he must feel for me, poor shipwrecked sailor that I am, kept for years a prisoner among savages, always, always thinking of my wife and my home, dreaming of her by night, talking to her, though she could not hear by day. I loved her more than all heaven and earth put together. Tell me where she is this instant, you wretched woman, who salved over her wickedness to her, as you do to me. The clock struck ten. Desperate positions require desperate measures. If you will leave the house now, I will come to you tomorrow and tell you all. What is more, you shall see your child now. She lies sleeping upstairs. Oh, sir, you have a child. You do not know that as yet. A little weakly girl, with just a heart and soul beyond her years. We have reared her up with such care. We watched her for we thought for many a year she might die any day, and we tended her, and no hard thing has come near her, and no rough word has ever been said to her. And now you will come, and will take her life into your hand, and will crush it. Strangers to her have been kind to her, but her own father, Mr. Frank, I am a nurse and I love her, and I tend her, and I would do anything for her that I could. Her mother's heart beats as hers beats, and if she suffers a pain, a mother trembles all over. If she is happy, it is her mother that smiles and is glad. If she is growing stronger, her mother is healthy. If she dwindles, her mother languishes. If she dies, well, I don't know. It is not everyone can lie down and die when they wish it. Come upstairs, Mr. Frank, and see your child. Seeing her will do good to your poor heart. Then go away, in God's name. Just this one night. Tomorrow, if need be, you can do anything. Kill us all, if you will. Assure yourself a great, grand man, whom God will bless for ever and ever. 
Come, Mr. Frank, the look of a sleeping child is sure to give peace. She led him upstairs, at first almost helping his steps, till they came near the nursery door. She had almost forgotten the existence of little Edwin. It struck upon her with a fright as the shaded light fell upon the other cot, but she skilfully threw that corner of the room into darkness and let the light fall on the sleeping Elsie. The child had thrown down the coverings, and her deformity, as she lay with her back to them, was plainly visible through her slight nightgown. Her little face, deprived of the lustre of her eyes, looked wan and pinched, and had a pathetic expression in it, even as she slept. The poor father looked and looked with hungry, wistful eyes, into which the big tears came swelling up slowly and dropped heavily down as he stood trembling and shaking all over. Nora was angry with herself for growing impatient of the length of time that long lingering gaze lasted. She thought that she waited for full half an hour before Frank stirred, and then, instead of going away, he sank down on his knees by the bedside and buried his face in the clothes. Little Elsie stirred uneasily. Nora pulled him up in terror. She could afford no more time, even for prayer, in her extremity of fear, for surely the next moment would bring her mistress home. She took him forcibly by the arm, but, as he was going, his eye lighted on the other bed. He stopped. Intelligence came back into his face. His hands clenched. His child? he asked. "'Her child,' replied Nora. "'God watches over him,' said she instinctively, for Frank's looks excited her fears, and she needed to remind herself of the protector of the helpless. "'God has not watched over me,' he said in despair, his thoughts apparently recoiling on his own desolate, deserted state. But Nora had no time for pity. Tomorrow she would be as compassionate as her heart prompted.' At length she guided him downstairs and shut the outer door and bolted it, as if by bolts to keep out facts. Then she went back into the dining room and effaced all traces of his presence as far as she could. She went upstairs to the nursery and sat there, her head on her hand, thinking what was to come of all this misery. It seemed to her very long before they did return, yet it was hardly eleven o'clock. She heard the loud, hearty Lancashire voices on the stairs, and for the first time she understood the contrast of the desolation of the poor man who had so lately gone forth in lonely despair. It almost put her out of patience to see Mrs. Openshaw come in, calmly smiling, handsomely dressed, happy, easy, to inquire after her children. "'Did Elsie go to sleep comfortably?' she whispered to Nora. Yes, her mother bent over her, looking at her slumbers with the soft eyes of love. How little she dreamed who had looked on her last. Then she went to Edwin, with perhaps less wistful anxiety in her countenance, but more of pride. She took off her things to go down to supper. Nora saw her no more that night. Beside the door into the passage, the sleeping nursery opened out of Mr. and Mrs. Openshaw's room, in order that they might have the children more immediately under their own eyes. Early the next summer morning, Mrs. Openshaw was awakened by Elsie's startled call of, Mother! Mother! She sprang up, put on her dressing gown, and went to her child. Elsie was only half awake, and in a not uncommon state of terror. Who was he, Mother? tell me who my darling no one is here you've been dreaming love waken up quite see it's broad daylight yes said elsie looking round her then clinging to her mother said but a man was here in the night mother nonsense little goose no man has ever come near you yes he did he stood there just by nora a man with hair and a beard and he knelt down and said his prayers. Nora knows he was here, mother, half angrily, as Mrs. Openshaw shook her head in smiling incredulity. Well, we will ask Nora when she comes, 
said Mrs. Openshaw soothingly. But we won't talk any more about him now. It's not five o'clock. It's too early for you to get up. Shall I fetch you a book and read to you? Don't leave me, mother, said the child, clinging to her. So Mrs. Openshaw sat on the bedside, talking to Elsie and telling her of what they had done at Richmond the evening before, until the little girl's eyes slowly closed and she once more fell asleep. "'What was the matter?' asked Mr. Openshaw, as his wife returned to bed. "'Elsie wakened up in a fright, with some story of a man having been in the room to say his prayers. A dream, I suppose.' And no more was said at the time. Mrs. Openshaw had almost forgotten the whole affair when she got up about seven o'clock, but, by and by, she heard a sharp altercation going on in the nursery. Nora speaking angrily to Elsie, a most unusual thing. Both Mr. and Mrs. Openshaw listened in astonishment. "'Hold your tongue, Elsie. Let me hear none of your dreams. Never let me hear you tell that story again.' Elsie began to cry. Mr. Openshaw opened the door of communication before his wife could say a word. "'Nora, come here!' The nurse stood at the door, defiant. She perceived that she had been heard, but she was desperate. "'Don't let me hear you speak in that manner to Elsie again,' he said sternly, and shut the door. Nora was infinitely relieved, for she had dreaded some questioning, and a little blame for sharp speaking was what she could well bear if cross-examination was let alone. Downstairs they went, Mr. Openshaw carrying Elsie, the sturdy Edwin coming step by step, right foot foremost, always holding his mother's hand. Each child was placed in a chair by the breakfast table, and then Mr. and Mrs. Openshaw stood together at the window, awaiting their visitor's appearance and making plans for the day. There was a pause. Suddenly, Mr. Openshaw turned to Elsie and said, "'What a little goosey somebody is with her dreams, waking up poor tired mother in the middle of the night with the story of a man being in the room.' "'Father, I'm sure I saw him,' said Elsie, half crying. "'I don't want to make Nora angry, but I was not asleep, for all she says I was. "'I had been asleep, and I awakened up quite wide awake, though I was so frightened. "'I kept my eyes nearly shut, and I saw the man quite plain, a great brown man with a beard. "'He said his prayers, and then he looked at Edwin, and then Nora took him by the arm and led him away.' after they had whispered a bit together. "'Now, my little woman must be reasonable,' said Mr. Openshaw, who was always patient with Elsie. "'There was no man in the house last night at all. No man comes into the house, as you know, if you think, much less goes up into the nursery. But sometimes we dream something has happened, and the dream is so like reality that you are not the first person, little woman, who has stood out that the thing has really happened. "'But indeed it was not a dream,' said Elsie, beginning to cry. Just then, Mr and Mrs Chadwick came down, looking grave and discomposed. All during breakfast time they were silent and uncomfortable. As soon as the breakfast things were taken away and the children had been carried upstairs, Mr Chadwick began in an evidently preconcerted manner to inquire if his nephew was certain that all his servants were honest, for that Mrs Chadwick had that morning missed a very valuable brooch, which she had worn the day before. She remembered taking it off when she came home from Buckingham Palace. Mr Openshaw's face contracted into hard lines, grew like what it was before he had known his wife and her child. He rang the bell, even before his uncle had done speaking. It was answered by the housemaid. "'Mary, was anyone here last night when we were away?' "'A man, sir, came to speak to Nora.' "'To speak to Nora? Who was he? How long did he stay?' "'I'm sure I can't tell, sir. He came perhaps about nine. "'I went up to tell Nora in the nursery, and she came down to speak to him. "'She let him out, sir. She will know who he was and how long he stayed.' She waited a moment to be asked any more questions, but she was not, so she went away. A minute afterwards, Openshaw made as though he were going out of the room, 
but his wife laid her hand on his arm. Do not speak to her before the children, she said, in her low, quiet voice. I will go up and question her. No, I must speak to her. You must know, said he, turning to his uncle and aunts. My missus has an old servant, as faithful as ever woman was, I do believe, as far as love goes, but at the same time, who does not always speak truth, as even the missus must allow. Now my notion is that this Nora of ours has been come over by some good-for-nothing chap, for she's at the time of life when they say women pray for husbands, any good lord, any, and has let him into our house, and the chap has made off with your brooch, a map and many another thing beside. It's only saying that Nora is soft-hearted and does not stick at a white lie. That's all, missus. It was curious to notice how his tone, his eyes, his whole face changed as he spoke to his wife. But he was the resolute man through all. She knew better than to oppose him. So she went upstairs and told Nora her master wanted to speak to her and that she would take care of the children in the meanwhile. Nora rose to go without a word. Her thoughts were these. If they tear me to pieces, they shall never know through me. He may come, and then, just Lord, have mercy upon us all. For some of us are dead folk to a certainty, but he shall do it, not me. You may fancy now her look of determination as she faced her master alone in the dining room, Mr. and Mrs. Chadwick having left the affair in their nephew's hands, seeing that he took it up with such vehemence. Nora, who is that man that came to my house last night? Man, sir, as if infinitely surprised, but it was only to gain time. Yes, the man whom Mary let in, whom she went upstairs to the nursery to tell you about, whom you came down to speak to, the same chap, I make no doubt, whom you took in the nursery to have your talk out with, whom Elsie saw and afterwards dreamed about, thinking, poor wench, she saw him say his prayers, when nothing I'll be bound was further from his thoughts, who took Mrs Chadwick's brooch, value ten pounds. Now, Nora, don't go off, I'm as sure as that my name's Thomas Openshaw, that you knew nothing of this robbery, but I do think you've been imposed on, and that's the truth. Some good-for-nothing chap has been making up to you, and you've been just like all other women, and have turned a soft place in your heart to him, and he came last night, a love your ring, and you had him up in the nursery, and he made use of his opportunities, and made off with a few things on his way down. Come now, Nora, it's no blame to you, only you must not be such a fool again. Tell us, he continued, what name he gave you, Nora. I'll be bound it was not the right one, but it will be a clue for the police. Nora drew herself up. You may ask that question and taunt me with me being single, and with me credulity as you will, Master Openshaw. You'll get no answer from me. As for the brooch and the story of theft and burglary, if ever any friend ever came to see me, which I defy you to prove and deny, he'd be just as much above doing such a thing as you yourself, Mr Openshaw, and more so too, for I'm not at all sure as everything you have is rightly come by, and would be yours long if every man had his own. She meant, of course, his wife, but he understood her to refer to his property in goods and chattels. Now, my good woman, said he, I'll just tell you truly, I never trusted you out and out, but my wife liked you, and I thought you had many a good point about you. If you once begin to sauce me, I'll have the police to you, and get out the truth in a court of justice, if you'll not tell it me quietly and civilly here. Now the best thing you can do is quietly to tell me who the fellow is. Look here, a man comes to my house, asks for you, you take him upstairs, a valuable brooch is missing next day. We know that you and Mary and Cook are honest, but you refuse to tell us who the man is. Indeed, you've told one lie already about him, saying that no one was here last night. Now, I just put it to you, what do you think a policeman would say to this, or a magistrate? A magistrate would soon make you tell the truth, my good woman. There's never the creature born that should get it out of me, said Nora, not unless I choose to tell. I've a great mind to see, said Mr Openshaw, growing angry at the defiance. Then, checking himself, he thought before he spoke again, Nora, 
for your missus's sake. I don't want to go to extremities. Be a sensible woman if you can. It's no great disgrace, after all, to have been taken in. I ask you, once more, as a friend, who was this man whom you let into my house last night? No answer. He repeated the question in an impatient tone. Still no answer. Nora's lips were set in determination not to speak. Then there is but one thing to be done. I shall send for a policeman. You will not, said Nora, starting forwards. You shall not, sir. No policeman shall touch me. I know nothing of the brooch. But I know this. Ever since I was four and twenty, I have thought more of your wife than of myself. Ever since I saw her, a poor motherless girl put upon in her uncle's house, I have thought more of serving her than of serving myself. I have cared for her and her child as nobody ever cared for me. I don't cast blame on you, sir, but I say it's ill, giving up one's life to anyone, for at the end they will turn round upon you and forsake you. Why does not my missus come herself to suspect me? Maybe she has gone for the police, but I don't stay here either for police or magistrate or master. You're an unlucky lot. I believe there's a curse on you. I'll leave you this very day. Yes, I'll leave that poor Elsie too. I will. No good will ever come to you. Mr Openshaw was utterly astonished at this speech, most of which was completely unintelligible to him, as may easily be supposed. Before he could make up his mind what to say or what to do, Nora had left the room. I do not think he had ever really intended to send for the police to this old servant of his wife's, for he had never for a moment doubted her perfect honesty, but he had intended to compel her to tell him who the man was, and in this he was baffled. He was consequently much irritated. He returned to his uncle and aunt in a state of great annoyance and perplexity, and told them he could get nothing out of the woman, that some man had been in the house the night before, but that she refused to tell who he was. At this moment his wife came in, greatly agitated, and asked what had happened to Nora, for that she had put on her things in passionate haste and had left the house. "'This looks suspicious,' said Mr Chadwick. "'It is not the way in which an honest person would have acted.' Mr Openshaw kept silence. He was sorely perplexed. But Mrs Openshaw turned round on Mr Chadwick with a sudden fierceness no one ever saw in her before. "'You don't know, Nora, uncle.' She's gone because she's deeply hurt at being suspected. Oh, I wish I had seen her, that I had spoken to her myself. She would have told me anything. Alice wrung her hands. I must confess, continued Mr Chadwick to his nephew in a lower voice, I can't make you out. You used to be a word and a blow, and often is the blow first. And now, when there is every cause for suspicion, you just do not. Your missus is a very good woman, I grant, but she may have been put upon as well as other folk, I suppose. If you don't send for the police, I shall. Very well, replied Mr Openshaw, surlily. I can't clear Nora. She won't clear herself as I believe she might if she would. Only I wash my hands of it, for I'm sure the woman herself is honest, and she's lived a long time with my wife, and I don't like her to come to shame. "'But she will then be forced to clear herself. "'That, at any rate, will be a good thing. "'Very well. "'I am heart-sick of the whole business. "'Come, Alice, but come up to the babies. "'They'll be in a sore way. "'I tell you, Uncle,' he said, "'turning round once more to Mr Chadwick, "'suddenly and sharply, "'after his eye had fallen on Alice's one tearful, anxious face. "'I'll have none send him for the police after all. I'll buy my aunt twice as handsome a brooch this very day, but I'll not have Nora suspected and my missus plagued. There's for you. He and his wife left the room. Mr Chadwick quietly waited till he was out of hearing and then said to his wife, For all Tom's heroics, I'm just quietly going for a detective, wench. Thou needst know naught about it. He went to the police station and made a statement of the case. He was gratified by the impression which the evidence against Nora seemed to make. The men all agreed in his opinion, and steps were to be immediately taken to find out where she was. 
most probably as they suggested she had gone at once to the man who to all appearance was her lover when mr chadwick asked how they would find her out they smiled shook their heads and spoke of mysterious but infallible ways and means he returned to his nephew's house with a very comfortable opinion of his own sagacity he was met by his wife with a penitent face oh master i have found me brooch it was just sticking by its pin in the flounce of my brown silk that i wore yesterday i took it off in a hurry and it must have caught in it and i hung up me gown in the closet just now when i was going to fold it up there was the brooch i'm very vexed but i never dreamt but what it was lost her husband muttering something very like confound thee and thy brooch too i wish i'd never given it thee snatched up his hat and rushed back to the station hoping to be in time to stop the police from searching for nora but a detective was already gone off on the errand where was nora half mad with the strain of the fearful secret she had hardly slept through the night for thinking what must be done upon this terrible state of mind had come elsie's questions showing that she had seen the man as the unconscious child called her father lastly came the suspicion of her honesty she was little less than crazy as she ran upstairs and dashed on her bonnet and shawl leaving all else even her purse behind her in that house she would not stay that was all she knew or was clear about she would not even see the children again for fear it should weaken her she feared above everything mr frank's return to claim his wife she could not tell what remedy there was for a sorrow so tremendous for her to stay to witness the desire of escaping from the coming events was a stronger motive for her departure than her soreness about the suspicions directed against her although this last had been the final goal to the course she took she walked away almost at headlong speed sobbing as she went as she had not dared to do during the past night for fear of exciting wonder in those who might hear her then she stopped an idea came into her mind that she would leave london altogether and betake herself to her native town of liverpool she felt in her pocket for her purse as she drew near the euston square station with this intention she had left it at home her poor head aching her eyes swollen with crying she had to stand still and think as well as she could where next she should bend her steps suddenly the thought flashed into her mind that she would go and find out poor mr frank she had been hardly kind to him the night before though her heart had bled for him ever since she remembered his telling her as she inquired for his address almost as she had pushed him out of the door of some hotel in a street not far distant from euston square thither she went with what intention she hardly knew but to assuage her conscience by telling him how much she pitied him in her present state she felt herself unfit to counsel or restrain or assist or do aught else but sympathise and weep the people of the inn said such a person had been there had arrived only the day before had gone out soon after his arrival leaving his luggage in their care but had never come back nora asked for leave to sit down and await the gentleman's return the landlady pretty secure in the deposit of luggage against any probable injury showed her into a room and quietly locked the door on the outside nora was utterly worn out and fell asleep a shivering starting uneasy slumber which lasted for hours the detective meanwhile had come up with her some time before she entered the hotel into which he followed her asking the landlady to detain her for an hour or so without giving any reason beyond showing his authority which made the landlady applaud herself a good deal for having locked her in he went back to the police station to report his proceedings he could have taken her directly but his object was if possible to trace out the man who was supposed to have committed the robbery then he heard of the discovery of the brooch and consequently did not care to return nora slept till even the summer evening began to close in then up someone was at the door it would be mr frank 
as she dizzily pushed back her ruffled grey hair which had fallen over her eyes, and stood looking up to see him. Instead, there came in Mr. Openshaw and a policeman. "'This is Nora Kennedy,' said Mr. Openshaw. "'Oh, sir,' said Nora, "'I did not touch the brooch. Indeed, I did not. Oh, sir, I cannot live to be thought so badly of.' And very sick and faint, she suddenly sank down on the ground. To her surprise, Mr. Openshaw raised her up very tenderly. Even the policeman helped to lay her on the sofa, and at Mr. Openshaw's desire he went for some wine and sandwiches, for the poor gaunt woman lay there almost as if dead with weariness and exhaustion. Nora, said Mr. Openshaw, in his kindest voice, the brooch is found. It was hanging to Mrs. Chadwick's gown. I beg your pardon. Most truly, I beg your pardon for having troubled you about it. My wife is almost broken-hearted. Eat, Nora, or stay, first drink this glass of wine, said he, lifting her head, pouring a little down her throat. As she drank, she remembered where she was and who she was waiting for. She suddenly pushed Mr. Openshaw away, saying, Oh, sir, you must go. You must not stop a minute. If he comes back, he will kill you. Alas, Nora, I do not know who he is, but someone is gone away who will never come back, someone who knew you and who I am afraid you cared for. I don't understand you, sir, said Nora, her master's kind and sorrowful manner bewildering her yet more than his words. The policeman had left the room at Mr. Openshaw's desire, and they two were alone. You know what I mean when I say that someone is gone who will never come back. I mean that he is dead. Who? said Nora, trembling all over. A poor man has been found in the Thames this morning, drowned. Did he drown himself? asked Nora solemnly. God only knows, replied Mr. Openshaw in the same tone. Your name and address at our house were found in his pocket. That and his purse were the only things that were found upon him. I'm sorry to say, my poor Nora, but you're required to go and identify him. To what? asked Nora. To say who it is. It is always done in order that some reason may be discovered for the suicide, if suicide it was. I make no doubt he was the man who came to see you at our house last night. It is very sad, I know. He made pauses between each little clause in order to try and bring back her senses, which he feared were wandering. So wild and sad was her look. Master Openshaw, said she at last, I've a dreadful secret to tell you. Only you must never breathe it to anyone, and you and I must hide it away for ever. I thought to have done it all by myself, but I see I cannot. Yon poor man, yes, the dead drowned creature, is I fear, Mr. Frank, my mistress's first husband. Mr. Openshaw sat down as if shot. He did not speak, but after a while he signed for Nora to go on. He came to me the other night, when, God be thanked, you were all away at Richmond. He asked me if his wife was dead or alive. I was a brute and thought more of your all coming home than of his sore trial. I spoke out sharp and said she was married again and very content and happy. I all but turned him away, and now he lies dead and cold. God forgive me, said Mr. Openshaw. God forgive us all, said Nora. Yon poor man needs forgiveness perhaps less than any one among us. He had been among the savages, shipwrecked, I know not what, and he had written letters which had never reached my poor missus. He saw his child? He saw her, yes. I took him up to give his thoughts another start, for I believed he was going mad on my hands. I came to seek him here, as I more than half promised. My mind misgave me when I heard he had never come in. Oh, sir, it must be him. Mr. Openshaw rang the bell. Nora was almost too much stunned to wonder at what he did. He asked for writing materials, wrote a letter, and then said to Nora, I am writing to Alice to say I shall be unavoidably absent for a few days, that I have found you, that you are well and send her your love and will come home tomorrow. 
You must go with me to the police court. You must identify the body. I will pay high to keep names and details out of the papers. But where are you going, sir? He did not answer her directly. Then he said, Nora, I must go with you and look on the face of the man whom I have so injured. Unwittingly, it is true, but it seems to me as if I had killed him. I will lay his head in the grave as if he were my only brother, and how he must have hated me. I cannot go home to my wife till all that I can do for him is done. Then I shall go with a dreadful secret on my mind. I shall never speak of it again, after these days are over. I know you will not either. He shook hands with her, and they never named the subjects again, the one to the other. Nora went home to Alice the next day. Not a word was said on the cause of her abrupt departure a day or two before. Alice had been charged by her husband in his letter not to allude to the supposed theft of the brooch. So she, implicitly obedient to those whom she loved both by nature and habit, was entirely silent on the subject, only treated Nora with the most tender respect, as if to make up for unjust suspicion. Nor did Alice inquire into the reason why Mr. Openshaw had been absent during his uncle and aunt's visit, after he had once said that it was unavoidable. He came back, grave and quiet, and from that time forth was curiously changed, more thoughtful and perhaps less active, quite as decided in conduct, but with new and different rules for the guidance of that conduct. Towards Alice, he could hardly be more kind than he had always been, but he now seemed to look upon her as someone sacred, and to be treated with reverence as well as tenderness. He throve in business and made a large fortune, one half of which was settled upon her. Long years after these events, a few months after her mother died, Elsie and her father, as she always called Mr. Openshaw, drove to a cemetery a little way out of town, and she was carried to a certain mound by her maid, who was then sent back to the carriage. There was a headstone with F.W. and a date. That was all. Sitting by the grave, Mr. Openshaw told her the story, and for the sad fate of that poor father, whom she had never seen, he shed the only tears she ever saw fall from his eyes. End of the Manchester Marriage by Elizabeth Gaskell